everybody. Once again, I'm happy that you chose to join us on our Mount Sinai MBC of Memphis YouTube channel. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come once again and say thank you. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, Father, for hearts and minds that desire to hear your word. We ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your word and that you would speak to us individually and collectively whenever and wherever we hear this message. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 13, a gospel church. And our author writes, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ, governed by his laws, and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word. That it's only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, and deacons whose qualification, claims, and duties are defined in the epistle to Timothy and Titus. And our scripture, once again, uh, in total, is coming from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. Uh, we started this study in verse 1, and if you have not heard it or don't remember it, then go back on our uh, YouTube page and just pick up, you know, the first lessons in, in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1, starting with verse 1. But today, I'll read verse 10 through 13, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It says, verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you by brother, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So we have said that the problem in the church was not due to doctrinal issues because the same message was preached by Paul and Apollos and Cephas. And the message preached was Jesus Christ crucified and rose from the dead. The problem was the style of preaching, the charisma of the preacher, and the deliverance of the message. I said problem, but in reality, that was not the problem because we're all different. As Christians, we are to be conformed to the image of Christ, but that does not mean that we have to change our personalities, our sense of humor, or uh, all of our natural qualities. We, we're not to become robots. When we are saved, we don't stop being the unique person that we are. God is the one who has formed us, and he has given each one of us our personalities and a set of qualities that are individual and unique to us. Nobody can outdo me in being me. I do it better than anybody else. Nobody can outdo you in being you. You do it better than anybody else. We don't have to change our personalities to be conformed to the image of Christ. We are called to follow him and serve him as unique individuals. Two people may have the same gift, but it's displayed in their own individual, unique personality. But the fact still remains that regardless of what personalities we have, we still have the problem of sin. That something in us that keeps us from completely and sincerely following Jesus Christ. Paul said it best in Romans 7 and 21, and this is the King James Version. He says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And the same verse in the 
Living Bible puts it in our language. It says, it seems to be a fact of life to, when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. It's not natural for us or for people in general to act in the way Christ would have us to act. Stuff we do on a regular basis, lying and cheating and evil thoughts and being two-faced and always having a comeback and just fill in the blank. The, the, the stuff that we do on a regular basis that's not of Christ, those things may be part of our personality now, but it was not a part of the personality that God originally gave to mankind. Our tendencies to sin were not given to us by God, but was inherited at birth as a result of the fall. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of, of Eden, as a result, sin entered and poisoned human nature. We were given over to the lust and desires of our corrupt natural flesh, and sin gained the upper hand in, in our thoughts and in our mind, and not just for Adam and Eve, but it went through the bloodline of humankind. Genesis 6 and 5, and this is the King James Version, it says, And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So from the first chapter in the Bible, where God declares everything to not just be good, but very good, to the sixth chapter where God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. It seems like a short time, just from chapter one to chapter six. When you read the Bible, it seems like such a short time. But we have to keep in mind that time is built into those chapters. In fact, Genesis five, one of those chapters that we skip over, gives us a sense of time. Uh, think about it. Adam lived 930 years. Scholars who study such things say that approximately 1,500 years, 1,500 years had passed between Genesis 1 and the beginning of Genesis 6. Think about that in the context of our year, 2022. If 15, 1,500 years ago would land us in the year 522. That is a long time for sin to multiply exponentially. So much so that the Bible says that God was sorry that he had made mankind. To put that in, to me, that puts in context how bad sin is in our day and time. And we've had more than 1,500 years for evil to multiply. But now here is the beauty for the ashes part of the story. Romans 8 and 3, King James Version says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. And because I, I have a simple mind, this is the same verse in the Living Bible says, Romans 8 and 3, it says, We aren't saved from sin's grasp by knowing the commandments of God because we can't and don't keep them. But God put into effect a different plan to save us. He sent his own son in a human body like ours, except that ours are sinful and destroyed sin, sin's control over us by giving himself as a sacrifice for our sin. So Jesus, the first and only human being in whom God was able to condemn sin in the flesh, when Jesus denied the lust to sin that was in his human nature, that was in the likeness of sinful man, 
Becoming like Christ requires us to do the same, to purify ourselves in the obedience to God's word. In other words, deny the lust of the flesh. We do this through and by the help of the Holy Spirit. And by doing this, we become like Jesus Christ. And, 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 and it frees us to be ourselves, the person God made us to be. Ephesians 2 and 10 tells us that we are his, meaning God's, workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I find that amazing. As one preacher says, that was the shout. No matter what personality we have, God has prepared beforehand meaning before we were born even before the creation of the world god prepared work for me work for you work that only you and your personality only me and my personality can accomplish and it is god's desire to use both us and our personality to do the good works he has prepared for us. Not only that, but the more we become like Christ by purifying ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit, we also become more and more free to be the individual in Christ that God intended us to be. We stop trying to be like somebody else or wishing somebody was like somebody. Now, of course I went around the world and through the woods to say that the church at Corinth, instead of accepting Apollos for who he was and accepting Paul and Peter for who they were, they turned their differences in style into division that was tearing up the church. There is nothing wrong with liking one particular style over another. Again, God made us different. We're different personalities. We all have different learning and hearing styles. And that is okay. It too is God given. Some people prefer a preacher that is charismatic. One that requires the listener to join in and with amens and, and with preach pastor and, and that sort of thing. Whereas some prepare, uh, prefer more of a studious type of preacher, more of a, a, a quiet, uh, just just not like the char char uh, charismatic type preacher. I think people, most people, probably fall somewhere in between the two. Not a whole lot of one and not a whole lot of the other. But the point is that there is nothing wrong with either style. God has given each his or all, her own personality. And he has given the listener his or, own, his or her own personality. And we shouldn't tear up the church because of it. In chapter 3, Paul, in essence, tells them that the reason they are having these type of arguments is because they are immature. They are still babies. He, he says that up until now, he had, not given the, he had given them only milk because they couldn't handle meat. And that even now, they were still not able to handle meat. And the proof was in the fact that they were acting like children. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 3 through 9, and this is the NIV, it says, You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow pa Apollos, are you not mere men? Are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. 
So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So Paul is saying that the emphasis must not be well, the emphasis must be on God and not the laborers. Paul and Apollos were only servants who did their assigned tasks. It was God who gave the increase. He is the Lord of the harvest. No one person can take credit, nor can any one person do all the work necessary to accomplish the task. Paul planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but only God can make it grow. We do well to remember that. No matter how great the work you might be assigned to do for the Lord, you are still a part of the harvest. You are not. You are just, I'm sorry, you are just a part. You are not the whole. God designed this thing so that it takes all of us. And even when the whole is working in unity, it's still takes God to give the increase. We cannot, no matter how great our task may be, we cannot give the increase. It takes God to give the increase. Well, that's all I have for today. Come back next time as we continue our study in the gospel of the gospel church. And until then, be safe, especially the holiday weekend is coming. Be safe and don't do anything crazy. And come back and join us next time. Until then, bye-bye. Take care.